Sometimes, but I wanted to come by just to introduce him, and I think many of you know him, you know of him. But uh, he is a man of, of, of great talents. And uh, first of all, he's uh, uh, it doesn't say it, but he's a doctor of uh, communications and computer sciences, uh, and uh, spent time in uh, in the local government in New Jersey as a <coughs> planning commissioner, and as a mayor, and a town council member. Uh, and someone who has a great deal of knowledge, but he specializes now, as you can see, in the Chinese American Heroes Dotto. In that organization, he has spent a tremendous amount of time and energy recognizing those Chinese Americans, in this case, our own Anson Burlingame, uh, for the accomplishments that they've made in a variety of fields. But it's so interesting, and, and it was it's so perfect. Most people don't know who Anson Burlingame is, and I think hopefully you'll answer the question. Did he ever live in Burlingame, or did he not live? No, no, no. I know, no, I, 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 but I didn't know. He was passing through. That's yeah, true. And he, much. and he passed through probably the greatest place on earth, didn't he? <laughs> uh, and then to name a city after him, because it uh, it is a, a real uh, unique situation. In fact, a number of years ago, I collected I collect signatures and kind of autographs and manuscripts, and I had one of his in Burlingame, and. Uh, uh, is that it? That's one of them. That's one of them. Oh, well, I donated it to the Historical Society in Burlingame because I, I, yes, I did. And that was in 1991 or two. But uh, I did that because I thought it was important that Burlingame have that and uh, to, to maintain. But it, more importantly, uh, we're here to listen to, to David tonight and to, to really recognize the, the legacy that, uh, that Anson uh, Burlingame left. But I wanted to just highlight the fact that we're, we're so blessed to have David in our community. And when he came from uh, we met and chatted uh, with the tenant when, right after you got here. And he resides in Foster City, but we had coffee because David, even at that time, wanted to get involved. He wanted to understand the community, wanted to be participate and do what he could to better the community. And he's been doing that since he's been here. Uh, and now that he's uh, retired, I know him also from the organization Chinese Americans, where he is very active and uh, plays a tremendous role there. So uh, I'm looking forward. But I wish I could stay here for a while for the whole program. I'll be here for a few minutes to, to watch. But uh, let me present to you Dr. David Chow. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for coming over here, now the senator for our uh, district over here. Um, the question is always, why am I interested in this? How did I get into this? After all, I don't live in Birmingham, right? I mean, that's, the, <coughs> that's one of the funny things. It just turns out that my son lives in uh, Birmingham, so that's how, how it happened. And uh, you all remember back in 2008, it was the centennial. So he was getting all kinds of stuff coming in there. And one day he came to me and said, OK, Dad, did you know that uh, our town is named after Anson Bernigan? No. You know, he, he, he was appointed by Lincoln to be the envoy to China. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so that's how it began. So I started uh, finding out more and more. and. The more I look at it, the more interesting it becomes. And so we spent almost five years on this thing. And uh, uh, I'll share with you what uh, the things that I have found out and what we intend to do with these things. Uh, with some luck, we might be able to do something great about it. And off the chance, I went to the city hall and found a portrait of uh, Mr. Uh, Bernie Game. And I thought that would be a nice uh, uh, for us tonight. Okay. So, who is he? And, you know, he, uh, he was, uh, what was the situation back in the 1860s when Lincoln appointed him both in China and uh, in the U.S.? And what was his contribution while in China, while in the U.S., and most importantly, while in Europe also? And then, uh, 
of course, he, he had um, uh, in the U.S. Uh, negotiated a treaty with China called the Birmingham Treaty. And what happened to it? And it had to be revoked in order to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act. So that sort of stopped the, uh, the, the, that act. And it couldn't really stop it, of course. Uh, the Birmingham Legacy and how we might be able to honor him. So that's what I intend to talk about. He was born, not here, uh, the uh, New Berlin, uh, New, uh, New York, and went to high school, uh, University of Michigan, and later the Harvard School for Law. He became a senator, a state senator in Massachusetts, and then later became a congressman. So that's where things began to happen. Uh, when he lost his uh, re-election in 60, it turns out that Lincoln was elected. He was helping Lincoln, and I jokingly told this gentleman over here, he probably worked too hard on the election of Lincoln and forgot his territory, so he lost it. So as a consolation prize from uh, Mr. Lincoln, uh, gave him an uh, appointment. It turns out that the initial appointment was to the Hungary, uh, Austria-Hungary uh, Empire. So on his way to Europe, they discovered that he was an abolitionist, talking about the, uh, the uh, separation of Hungary from Austria. The emperor said, oh, that's not what I want, a rebel also in my country. <laughs> no, we don't want you. So he got the consolation prize of going to China. <laughs> and then, what's most amazing, on his way back after six years, Qin Dynasty says, will you be my envoy? Lo and behold, he became the envoy from China to the US and to the Western powers at that time. He, uh, and then he died in uh, St. Petersburg while serving there. Yeah. And when he died in, uh, in uh, St. Petersburg, a special, not a plane, a special <coughs> ship was chartered by China to send his body back to Massachusetts uh, to be uh, to be uh, buried there, and he was buried in uh, in Cambridge, where he came from, and he received a royal decree recognizing his work, uh, awarded him the civilian rank of number one, the top ranking civilian and as well as awarded him a 10,000 uh, beyond, which is uh, equivalent to about 50 ounces of, uh, and, and therefore it's about uh, uh, 500 kilograms to his family. So what does a uh, royal decree look like? That's what a royal decree look like. And basically said that's the decree, and usually on a yellow uh, silk, and this happens to be, and in order to be official, it got to be a big stamp. So that's the stamp uh, in, in here. And this has the particular date of uh, the uh, uh, April. Yeah. And the, this the text, and uh, I really don't expect you to be able to read it, but the point <laughs> is, that's where it says civilian rank number one. And that's what it says awarding him the uh, 10,000 uh, the, uh, the silver uh, man. Okay. So that's what a royal decree looked like. So what was the condition back in China in the 40s and the 60s uh, when uh, Anson Birmingham were beheading there? Well, that was the time many of you might have heard of the Opium War. Opium War was created, uh, was uh, uh, initiated by Britain who wanted to make trade, and uh, partly because uh, they always have wanted silk and porcelain, but they don't have anything that China wanted. So instead of uh, losing silver, the only thing they would take is silver, so to keep on collecting uh, silver. So they found, it, they found it that, hey, we need to open up the port to have a trade. And China said no, and they used the gunboat and went in and open five ports of all the things to trade opium. 
the bank that's the cheapest commodity and the highest the uh, uh, margin of uh, profit, I guess. Uh, there. And more importantly, the so-called extraterritoriality, which basically says that the place where they, uh, the Western country in this particular Britain goes into, they don't have to observe the Chinese law. They observe their own law. And so, as a consequence, that causes all kinds of uh, uh, headaches right there. Uh, first of all, they see uh, Hong Kong uh, took it over. And uh, you might remember the return of uh, Hong Kong back in the, uh, 1997. The, uh, of course, there was a uh, indemnity on top of it, and saying that, I invaded you, I spent so much money on you, now you have to pay me back. Right? You know, that's the way. How, how indemnity works, uh, and it was a huge humiliation. And then it turns out that that was not good enough for Britain there. So to rub salt on the wounds, they initiated the Second War. And the Second Opium War, to, to, and in this case, uh, along with France, and it started the Beijing Treaty. Fundamentally, it opened more ports, but most importantly, wanted to go into uh, Beijing. The emperor ran away, so the, the city was essentially open, and these forces just went in, burned, and looted the summer palace. All the uh, imperial treasures were stolen uh, uh, during that time. Yeah. And on top of it, which is mostly humiliating, to China or the, uh, the uh, Qing dynasty at that time is to have a legation right in their door. Uh, in other places, it's fine, but not in my backyard, right? I mean, it, it, it's like a, a legation with extraterritorial rights right in Washington, D.C. Uh, that type of time. And that's the beginning of the coolies uh, going to North America. America part of the agreement there. And certainly they cause internal chaos and uh, instability. In particular, at that particular time, you might remember one of the things that the Western power went to China is to believe to convert all these uh, Chinese into Christianity, in the belief that Christianity is what's the best for everyone. So lo and behold, here's a guy that by the name of Hong Xiu Quan, under the heading of the Taiping. What happened to him was that he could pass the royal exam to be part of the, uh, uh, the officials. He tried five times. He failed. And so he went to sleep one day and woke up and saying that, hmm, I have met Jesus Christ. He is my brother. So based on that, he was proselytizing Christianity under the basis of his dream. And that certainly infuriated the Western powers. And the irony is that the Qin Dynasty used a British general by the name of uh, Charles uh, uh, Gordon, a general, to fight and suppress the rebellion. So it's really, really a strange situation. So they were humiliated, they was caught up, they was addicted with opium, and created chaos. And this is the guy that pretended that believed that he was uh, the uh, brother of uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, complete chaos uh, in China at that time. So what was the case in the U.S.? The U.S. was still very young there, and keep on going west, acquiring new territories, becoming new states in there. And around the, the time of the 84, uh, the U.S. says, hey, the door of China was open. Let's get into it, too. So they went in and uh, signed treaty with China. And because of the concept of the, uh, the most so-called most favored nation, 
whatever United Kingdom got, uh, anyone else that is considered the most favored nation in this situation, any of the Western powers, get it. So U.S. did not have to fight, and they got all the privileges that Britain did on behalf of, uh, of trade and other things. And for, the, uh, for us, in the U.S., we definitely decided not to legalize opium in that particular tre uh, treaty of, uh, of the, uh, the, Wang, uh, the Wang, Wang Xia Treaty, at least on paper, right? I mean, we believe that it is not legal to, to use opium as, as a means of addicting other people and taking that in. And of course, in our country, then it, it, slavery started to become an issue. And Lincoln was elected, and we know what happened the cessation of the southern states. Again, it's kind of interesting to see this after Mr. Obama's win, and some of the southern states start to talk about, hey, we want to secede from the Union. Isn't that kind of funny? They're repeating uh, the history uh, in there. Maybe I saw some of the uh, people were saying, let them secede. And then all of a sudden, then we can build a wall. And then they have to have the visa to come in to work in our country. <laughs> and then uh, we have to have uh, uh, prevent, uh, to issue passport and identification for them to come in, right? Isn't that going to be funny? Okay. Of course, we had the Civil War. And after that, the reconciliation and reconstruction and things of that sort. Okay. So that was the period of uh, our country uh, in the 1840s and 60s. Yeah. So during that particular time, there was the gold rush in the late 40s and the, to the early 50s. And Chinese laborers were used extensively uh, in, in, in the mines. <clears throat> and then uh, over here in California, we have the Sacramento San, San Joaquin uh, Valley uh, levee that was built by Chinese labor. Uh, there are a lot of them. And that created the zone, allowed the agriculture to develop in California. And that provided the, the extensive uh, uh, produce uh, year round in, in California. Of course, uh, Lincoln was elected, and one of the things that happened that was the, uh, <coughs> the building of the Transcontinental Railway. Uh, this is a diagram that at the end of uh, May 10th, 1869, <coughs> when the Central Pacific part of, uh, of the railroad from Sacramento met with the Pacific, or, or the other way around. The, 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 Pacific Central, Pacific Railroad, Pacific Central Railroad, and the Union Central Railroad met in Utah, in Promontory, Utah, in uh, 19, 1869, with Mr. Lehman doing the last spike on the, uh, on the railroad. But the significant part is the fact that with all the building on the western part of the transcontinental uh, railway, railway, there was no recognition of the Chinese in that photograph. Of course, we have our civil war. Then Lincoln was assassinated. And then we have the reconstruction uh, after that, which basically <coughs> raises the issue of limited citizenship or full citizenship. And that was the one that, after the war, that was never resolved fully. So what was Anson's uh, contribution in the uh, in, in China? He developed the policy of cooperative policy over the doctrine, the, uh, the uh, concession, which is essentially soft power versus power. Uh, using the persuasion as opposed to over the barrel of the gun that the other countries were doing. 
he introduced that. He advocated China's uh, sovereignty and territorial territorial integrity, and uh, because he was a, uh, really a Christian uh, person, he gave a fair and Christian uh, construction to his uh, his effort uh, why in China. Okay. You'll see some of these things that he has done. He promoted a trade with technology transfer, but does that mean? That was the period of the railroads. So he helped bring people coming in and saying that let's uh, see how we can build a railroad. And the other thing was the telecommunication. Yeah, the uh, use code and other things before, <coughs> before telephone was invented. He encouraged a Chinese student to study in the US. That was the first back in, in, in that, that, that time. Yeah. <clears throat> now, when I say the uh, fair and Christian construction, again, everybody can talk about fairness. What he was able to do is demonstrate that. And what he did was, even though it was under the, the extraterritorial uh, situation, he held his own court of a case of where the Chinese complained of the sky murdering three Chinese. So what happened then is that he accepted the testimonies, and because of this testimony, he convicted the guy to be executed for killing this. So D speaks louder than words, is really what it all boils down to. And I presume it was one of this particular observation that the Qing Dynasty had a good feel for Mr. Burning Game when the time comes. <coughs> Why in, in, the, in the U.S. he spoke favorably of, uh, of China, and I think uh, as um, Senator uh, Hill mentioned that on his way, uh, on his uh, uh, home leave, he passed by over here on his way back, and throughout the U.S. he was speaking on behalf of China. He negotiated the first equal treaty in 1868 when he came back. It was generally referred to as the Burning Game Treaty, although sometimes it's also referred to as the Burning Game Seward Treaty, or Seward, uh, who was the Secretary of State. Basically accepted China as an equal uh, yeah, uh, as equal and not interfere with the internal affairs. Uh, open two-way unlimited immigration. So this is where it caused the problem in the, in the later on. And the most important aspect is free to reside, travel, and study in either nation. This is important to the U.S. for the simple reason that it allowed them to travel and uh, in China to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to talk about their Christianity and, and, and other things, which China was trying to prevent uh, the Western uh, people from doing. And this allowed the first Chinese education mission in the U.S. in 1872 with uh, children coming to the U.S. to study as a group. And the idea behind it was to let these young people adapt to the U.S. situation so that when they go back, they will know better the culture, and the, uh, the language, and other skills. And on this process, uh, we met the, uh, President Johnson and, um, uh, to, uh, to sign the treaty, uh, yeah. as well as uh, with the uh, Chinese boy, uh, together with him, uh, to be the president. Yeah. Uh, later you'll see who are some of the mission members. And then he took this <coughs> to the European countries, in particular to first uh, to the United Kingdom to see King Victoria, and basically saying that here is a model of the Bernicke Treaty, fundamentally along the equal treaty of the two countries. Uh, basically what uh, the British just said was that, how nice, yes, we agree. <laughs> and dropped it. It's what a boy down to. 
right? I mean, it's easy to agree. It's not. It's hard to have a signature behind. It. Same thing with France. Went to see Emperor Napoleon the Third, and the France really had no objections. That. And but was very reluctant to uh, to agree to the writing. Same thing in Prussia, the predecessor to uh, to Germany, and then to Russia. These are the four major powers that he wanted to be able to to bring home. Uh, to China, a, a equivalent of the Birmingham Treaty the, on, on behalf of China. Right? Yeah. But then, and then during this uh, process, he introduced uh, his two argument uh, to the European leaders. But unfortunately, he died in St. Petersburg while serving the Chinese envoy. Yeah. <coughs> and then the, the, uh, the mission was continued by Zidane and Sejago. Uh, they went to 11 countries over a two year and eight months span. So he led a mission and then he was unable to complete but was able to carry on by, by the uh, folks. So who are these folks? There's no doubt this is this burn again, sitting over here. And these two are the high official uh, from China to accommodate him so that they can learn the ropes uh, as well as uh, help in, 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 in what, uh, what the uh, China is. And uh, this is uh, this is Yaku and this is Zidane. And these two gentlemen, white men, yeah, were recruited by Burning Game to be on the trip because one is a British subject, one is a French subject so that they can help in the translation process as well as the networking and finding the right person to be uh, interacting with. Okay. And in the back, the eight folks in there are the attaché. Typically, they are the students of learning the uh, language and will be able to do the translation and to do other work and, and things of that sort. So in addition to this, uh, there were uh, approximately 20 other uh, supporting staff like the cooks and and and, and, uh, and um, copy and uh, other things uh, associated with this. I don't know where they find the Chinese food, but uh, <laughs> here's a photo or or a equivalent of the photo of um, meeting uh, President Johnson after the signing of the Burning Man Treaty, whereby uh, Burning Man introduced the, uh, his colleagues, <coughs> his uh, his mission. Here's a situation in, Fran uh, in France, uh, in front of uh, Napoleon, uh, same thing. Uh, here's a mystic, I believe this is a burning game. And then the, uh, the Chinese, uh, two Chinese staff uh, uh, associated with him here. Uh, on free time, they were able to take a visit to Niagara Fall. Uh, here's a mystic uh, burning game. Okay. And at home, uh, they probably miss some nice food, uh, so they, they have uh, some kitchen staff to, to prepare the food for them. And here is a, uh, a photo or, or a sketch from the Harper's Magazine uh, for Thanksgiving 1869. So this was a period, this, uh, this is the high period of, uh, of recognition of the Chinese uh, in America. And this is the, the, the recognition of the diversity in our country over a Thanksgiving uh, dinner. Uh, like I say, this is back in the Thanksgiving of 1869. <coughs> Unfortunately, from here on, it's downhill for the Chinese uh, people here. Revoking, revoking the Burning Gate Treaty. So what happened then is that fundamentally in, in, in America, uh, during and before the Civil War, there's lots of work, construction, and things of that sort. And therefore, you needed more people. And then when it's done, recession and this construction needed less people. So what do you do? You try to Run them up and kick them out is what the boy down is. But you don't do that with humans, right? I mean, in, in, in there. 
So uh, the concept is, in fact, there is a book written by Jean Pfizer about the period in the 1870s about uh, called Driven Out. Uh, fundamentally, uh, a, a number of um, uh, cities and, and, and other places throughout, mostly in the uh, West Coast, um, and just took advantage of, uh, of the Chinese around there, and uh, being a able to, to just run them up and, and saying, that, hey, go, put them on the ship. It doesn't matter where you go, right? You just ship them out. <coughs> and uh, of course, uh, stop the immigration. Okay, that's where the Birmingham Treaty comes in, to says uh, free immigration. Well, one of the acts that was proposed in Congress called the 15 Passenger Bill. It was that they tried all kinds of effort in, in, in stopping the immigration. The issue is in what way is it, quote, legal or, or reasonable. And they tried to pass a 15 passenger bill, which essentially says that any ship coming from Asia cannot have more than 15 passengers from any one country. And lo and behold, uh, President Hayes says, hey, this doesn't sound right. He, uh, it, it, it violated the principle of uh, the immigration part of the Birmingham Treaty. And also, that's no way to treat a friendly nation. And on top of it, oh, oh so, so, so instead, then he said, he, uh, he vetoed that. And then later he sent uh, a, another envoy to China to renegotiate the Birmingham Treaty by the name of James Angel. Yeah. Uh, what he wanted to do, or what was asked him to do, was to suspend but not to prohibit the immigration. Sort of legalese way of saying that we don't want you. But it's supposed to reaffirm the MF privilege in the US, which means protect them in there. Okay. A piece of irony here is that James Angel turns out to be a distant cousin of Ensign. Thanks for coming. Yeah. How would I know? I didn't know. And it just turned out that the key was Angel. <coughs> and it turns out that <coughs> Anson's mother is a free love Angel. And it didn't hit me either. It just turns out that we have a colleague uh, 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 in this project kind of thing that, that we work together, including later on, I'll introduce uh, Joanne too. Uh, the, uh, he happens to be the descendant of Anson Burningham's sister, Betsy. So of all the things, and he lives around here. He lives in Redwood City. And he was a former uh, librarian with Stanford University. So he was very interested, of course, in the Anson Burningham uh, lineage. But more importantly, he is very familiar with the genealogy, his interest in that. He said, let me see, I think that sounds familiar. And he discovered that the seventh generation of they met. <laughs> so so it, it, isn't it kind of ironic that it, it was uh, repealed by a cousin uh, of, of Anson? So that led to the dark period of the Chinese Exclusion Act it, <clears throat> of 1882 that was passed by Congress and signed by President Arthur. Some of the things is, in theory, as the, the negotiated one, suspend for 10 years, again, in principle. Okay. But most importantly, it requires identification card for them, which sounds very familiar with what we're doing now to some of the, uh, the Hispanics. And <coughs> immediately, China recalled the, uh, the uh, uh, education mission in protest. That's Sorry. <coughs> To add um, uh, the, to rub salt on the uh, on, on the injury on top of it, because again, 
is that there's this Scott Act a few years later to prevent the re-entry of Chinese after visiting China. They were promised <coughs> with, with a legal document coming home. And so, and then on top of that, the, uh, the uh, oh, in fact, in fact, the uh, part of the problem also over here is that those people, those children born in the U.S. with Amendment 14 says that they are U.S. citizens. They could come back, or they can, and, 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 and that was part of the difficulty also. And then Gary, after 10 years, it got extended to for another 10 years. So be careful when people say it's for 10 years. So remember our fiscal crisis? Yeah. <laughs> you have to do something. Yeah. And <clears throat> on top of it, yeah, this says that bar the Chinese from uh, their witness in court. Yeah. Now, remember back in 1860s, Mr. Burningham even in China accepted the witness of the local people uh, they, they, and prevented them from receiving bills and prices. And <clears throat> so in 1902, another 10 year passed, boom, if you don't have to do anything, then you keep on extended indefinitely. Yeah? And it was not repealed until in 1943. When all of a sudden China is a friend of U.S. and U.S. depend on China to fight Japan. Now all of a sudden, uh, the uh, Madame Chiang Kai-shek came to the U.S. and and basically said, "What's going on?" Yeah. So Congress immediately repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act or the um, Morrison Morrison uh, uh, Act of 1943. And then, of course, <coughs> uh, Congress uh, recently uh, the, uh, approved, uh, passed the resolution of regret for having passed the Chinese Exclusion Act back in, uh, in uh, 2011 in the Senate. And, <coughs> and, <coughs> and 2012, this year, in the House. So this is where we want to see. So Anson Burningham, I believe he's a Renaissance man way ahead of his time. Okay. So what did he do? He's a principle in the equality of man and the equality of nation, not just the people, but also nation Advocated anti-slavery in, in, uh, in the US and uh, promoted uh, cooperative policy around in outside in China. Yeah. So he was the one that practiced so-called a soft power and the hard power before this term was even invented about a decade ago or so here in this country. Yeah. And he was a world diplomat. He represented the, from the youngest nation of U.S. to the oldest nation, in this case China, way back in the 1860s. And most importantly, uh, one of the things that was recognized by a world-known <coughs> writer, Mark Twain. And let's hear what he said. For he had outgrown the narrow citizenship of a state and become a citizen of the world. And his charity was large enough and his great heart warm enough to feel for all its races and to labor for them. He was a good man, and a very, very great man. America lost a son and all the world a servant when he died. That's supposed to be Mark Twain. <laughs> By a local, uh, local uh, actor. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that, but let you right. believe that it was, <laughs> was the original. That was part of a eulogy that Mark Twain wrote. And I just took that particular paragraph to believe in that, that you know, kind of pretty much just summarizes the feelings. So how might we do to recognize this legacy? 
I believe that let the world know about Ash and Burning Game. Here we have uh, the, uh, or maybe 50 people uh, there. And most people don't know who he was and what did he do. And even uh, the, uh, the people in, uh, in Burning Game. But, you know, make it known, encourage more publications. What did he do? Invest in films and movie documentation. Uh, this is real. We are working on that. Uh, for the simple reason that every time we talk about the uh, Anson Burning Game, uh, half of the people would say, oh, we, we want one of the things that later you'll see that we want to create an award bearing his name, Anson Burning Game Award. So, so who the heck is Anson Burning Game? <laughs> right? It, it, you know, how many people know about it? So uh, we're thinking about the, uh, doing a, uh, a, a documentation or a actual film. It's quite a uh, quite a character. There are many things that we could uh, write write about him, showing about him. Perhaps an organizing conference to debate on the issues there. Things like the strategic partner versus the. Uh,